Hello, thank you for joining us, Friendship Christian Church, Friendship Ministries YouTube channel. Today we're in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The message title is, Who is Your Theophilus? Before we get into the message, I do want to let you know we're going to start with the word of prayer, and then we'll go into the message, and then we'll end with the word of prayer. But after that, I'm going to invite you to stay for the Lord's Supper. We're going to take the emblems of the bread and the cup, and I, I really want you to participate in that. So please get you something to eat, something to drink. It does not have to be unleavened bread. It does not have to be fruit of the vine. God will take care of it. Just get you something so you can participate in that communion service. Let us now have a word of prayer. Fathers, you search our hearts and our minds. We just pray that you meet all those needs that are listed there. And Father, we pray for your hand on our personal prayer list. Do you give peace, comfort, and healing to where it's needed? Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is your Theophilus? Now, Luke uh, writes this gospel uh, as a physician, he is a Greek, he is a physician, he's a man of science, and he is the only Gentile to have a book in the Bible. He is the writer of the third gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, and his writings have been proven to be historically accurate. Now, Luke was born around 16 AD in Antioch, Syria, which at that time was a Roman uh, province in the Roman Empire. Tradition teaches that Luke died in AD 84 in Boeotia, Greece, where he settled to write the Gospel and Acts. It's believed that Luke's tomb is located in Thebes, Greece, and eventually his relics were transferred to Constantinople in the year of 357. Now Luke joined Paul in Troas in the year 51, accompanying him on his missionary journey from Macedonia to Philippi. It's very possible that Luke became the personal physician of Paul as he had several ailments, Plus, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was jailed, and uh, he needed uh, a lot of attention after those things. Now, the church has relied heavily. If you look around today, the church has relied heavily on programs, personalities, organizations, events, instead of just one thing. The one thing, God just God. God has instructed his followers to invest themselves in the lives of individuals as the most vital avenue of bringing people to Christ, witnessing and making disciples. And it's easy to overlook uh, the value of investing yourself in a life of just one individual when uh, the whole world is lost, the whole world is on fire. But if you, can, if you can focus on one and bring that gospel message to that one, then you can move on to the next one. And uh, Dr. Luke uses this strategy when he addresses the gospel of Luke to one individual named Theophilus. Now, God uses personal relationship throughout the world and down through the years, all the way through the scriptures. One can see the need to lead and assist the followers of Jesus by using personal relationships. And so, like Luke, who is you're a Theophilus. Every follower of Jesus must take the initiative to tell people about Jesus. The identity of the one who tells 
is I. I must take the initiative. I can't just wait around and wait for somebody to come and say, please tell me about Jesus. It's not going to happen. You must take the initiative. It begins with I. Now let's take a look at Luke 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. The I indicates that Luke took the initiative to tell his friend Theophilus all about Jesus, to make sure that he had gotten the truth. Luke undertakes the opportunity to witness and does so as the least likely. He was a Gentile. He writes as the only Gentile writer in the New Testament and from the position of not having been an apostle or even a church leader. You see, to, to tell someone about Jesus, you don't have to have a leadership role in the church. And you're still a vital witness of Jesus. Uh, this brings to mind a, a man that... Uh, his name is going to become very familiar to you when I say it. His name is Henry John Hines, and uh, he started as a producer of horseradish and became known as Hines 57 Varieties. You probably had his ketchup. He was also a Christian with a zeal to be a witness for Jesus. At a revival meeting one day, the minister turned to him and said, You are a Christian man. Why aren't you up and at it? Uh, he went home uh, in anger and went to bed. But he could not sleep. At four o'clock in the morning, he prayed that God would give him the faith and the strength to be a witness to someone. And then he went to sleep. At his next business meeting that he attended shortly afterward, he turned to the man next to him and spoke to him of his Christian life. This man looked at him in an amazement and said, I've wondered many times why you never spoke to me about it if you really believed in Christ. He wanted to hear it, but he didn't want to ask. So Heinz, by taking the initiative, that man got to hear the gospel message. How many people do you encounter that know that you're a Christian and they just might be wondering how many times before you finally stop and talk to them about Christ? Because the information that you have if a, it's of immense worth. Luke refers to others. He said, I too decided to write an orderly account. We already had some eyewitnesses that wrote, but he says, I too undertake this. And that becomes what we know of as the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel contains 10 historical facts about Jesus. The, the virgin birth, the sinless life, the marvelous teachings, the mighty miracles, the betrayal, arrest, uh, the trial, condemnation, crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And then the appearance of Jesus to, to many before he ascends. These ten historical facts form the backbone of Luke's gospel. The rest of the book is an amplification of those facts. A remarkable story is told about an exceedingly uh, costly, expensive jewel 
that for many years was considered to be of no more value than just a pebble. Uh, Gustav Gilman, a Chicago lapidary, uh, he's a jeweler, uh, was at work in his shop when John Myhook of Omaha entered. Myhook, who was a laborer, drew out of his pocket a rough red stone and handed it to Gilman. I want you to cut and polish this, said Myhook. And where did you get it, gasped Gilman. As his eyes, his eyes like wide and almost popped out of his head. Uh, my father picked it up in Hungary 50 years ago, replied Myhook. He thought it was a pretty pebble. When I landed in this country, I found it in my valise. It's been lying around the house ever since. The children played with it. My last baby cut his teeth on it. One night, I dreamed it was a diamond and worth a lot of money. But it's not a diamond. It's red. Gilman said, no, it's not a diamond. It's a pigeon's blood ruby. What might it be worth, was the question of mine hook. I'd say $100,000 to $250,000, said Gilman. My hook leaned against the door. This rough rock, this rough rock that was played with, teeth were cut on it. It just rolled around in a drawer. This ruby was believed to be the largest pigeon blood ruby in the world. A tattered book that you might hold in your hand. Pages getting fragile. Just might be the most precious book in the world. It just might be the Holy Bible that you're reading, that you might be using to lead someone else to Christ. Some people never know the worth of something unless someone else tells them. Some people do not know the worth of the Christian life, of turning their life over to Christ, until someone like you tells them. Every follower of Christ needs to be a witness to those who are outside of the faith. That means that your interaction with unbelievers needs to be intentional. Unbelievers are not all that insulated from hearing about Jesus. They see billboards, they drive past churches, they see TV programs, they hear radio messages, they hear songs during the holidays but they still don't become believers. The Gospel of Luke was written with the intention of leading Theophilus, a Greek Gentile, someone who heard and knew about Jesus, come to the faith of accepting Jesus and giving his life to Jesus. Luke knew that his relationship with Theophilus was an opportunity of helping him, by giving him the truth, by helping him to believe the truth of what he had heard about Jesus. So Luke became intentional in presenting the claims of Jesus to him in written form so that Theophilus could have a clear understanding of all he needed to know about Jesus. And being written, he heard now, he's, you know, it's written, he sees. It might be a personal testimony. It might be an act of kindness or something else. But don't miss an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. Jesus puts people in your path all through your life. At that intersection, stop. Be intentional. Tell them about Jesus. All you have to do is share what Jesus did in your life. You don't have to be a theologian. 
Luke invested his time and energy in writing the Gospel of Luke on a scroll. That scroll, a scroll was found at the Dead Sea. We have a Dead Sea scroll of Luke. And when they found one that was not so fragile that they could unroll it, they unrolled it and it was 25 feet long. Luke invested a lot of his time to write a 25 foot long scroll just so Theophilus could know the truth of what he heard about Jesus. We need to be faithful in following Luke's example. Take a little time and tell somebody about what Jesus has done for you. Interaction with unbelievers can have results, but you may never see it. You might invest in the life of an unbeliever and never see how God blesses that investment. Did you ever stop to think that Luke intended his gospel for one man, Theophilus, that a 25-foot scroll would spread down through history and people are still reading the book, the gospel of Luke today? He never dreamed it would go anywhere past Theophilus. And he wrote it almost 2,000 years ago. In the Museum of Science in Chicago, there's an interesting display. It's a checkerboard. And it's blown up uh, real big and placed on a table. And uh, it's in a glass case. And in the lower left-hand square, the first square on the board, there's one tiny little wheat seed glued in place. There are two seeds in the second square, four on the third, eight on the fourth, 16 on the fifth, and so on. It's exponential growing wheat seeds. And it starts to spill all over the next square. Underneath, in front of the table, there's a bronze plaque that says, this is the potential for multiplication from one grain of wheat in exponential growth. They had to stop on the eighth square because the square could not contain the numbers. It had multiplied to by the eighth square. Had they continued to the 64th square, there would have been enough wheat seeds to fill the entire subcontinent of India 50 feet deep. Just think about that. As you consider the truth of this display, you can see how the early church started with one word from one man to one person about the salvation of Jesus in this world, and we have Christianity all around the world. Luke found his Theophilus and wrote him a letter, a 25-foot-long scroll, that almost 2,000 years later, we're still reading it. You can have that same impact. You can have that same impact. See, Luke is long gone. He never dreamed there'd be someone named Burt Patterson who would read the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. Anybody who's faithful needs to make themselves available. Anybody can have an impact. You just have to be willing. God will do the rest. There's a Theophilus out here waiting on you right now and wants to hear from you. They're just not going to say it. They're just not going to say it. Every person, every person, you have the potential to be a Luke. The words you speak, the letters you write, the actions you do should be full of Jesus each and every day. Your Theophilus is watching. He's listening. And he's waiting for you to bring Jesus to him. Won't you be about it? 
Won't you be about it? But you can't be unless you have Jesus in your life. Unless you actually have something to share. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, or if you had years ago and you, you walked away, you found yourself straying, get it right today. Get it right. Come, come to Jesus. Get it right. If you have any questions, if you need some help, you can call me. 502-220-1285. I'd be glad to answer any question. I'd be glad to help you along the way. Just, just make yourself available to reach out to Jesus. Now I'd like to close with the word of prayer, but I'm going to ask you to stay and take the Lord's Supper with me. Let us pray. Fathers, we go out into this world. We just pray that you'll give us the will, the strength, and the faith to reach out and share with someone what Jesus has done for us. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for staying. Thank you for staying. Uh, get you something to eat. Doesn't matter what it is. Get you something to eat. Because uh, Jesus gave himself on the cross. He took the sins of the world onto his body. A body that was dehydrated. A body that was fatigued. A body that was beaten. A body that was nailed to the cross. And that body experienced death. And with that death, he died for your sins. Your sins died too. And so in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us, for me, for you, we take this Lord's Supper. Because he said, do this. Do this in remembrance of me. And that's what we're doing. So get you something to eat. And let us have a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you take this element. That you transconfigure it to be the substance it should be. For Jesus died for our sins. It was the body of the innocent that was given for the guilty. Father, we ask your blessings on this element in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's not all Jesus did. He gave you forgiveness by dying for your sins. But he also gives you eternal life. If you are totally righteous, totally righteous, no sin in you, you can go to heaven when you die. Well, as I look around, I haven't, I'm not perfect. I've sinned. I haven't met anyone who hasn't. So Jesus did something else on that cross. He gave all of his blood. And that blood, his blood, is our righteousness. Is our righteousness. So he gives us not just forgiveness of sin, but with his perfect, sinless blood, he gives us righteousness to go and live in heaven with him for all eternity. Get you something to drink. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you take the elements of this cup, that you transconfigure it to be the substance it should be. As Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection, by his blood we too 
follow him to eternal life in paradise. Father, we ask your blessings on this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, and may we all go in peace.